Hello everyone. If I could just welcome you to the first breakout session that we have today. I'm Steve Edwards, the head of the Health Technology Assessment Group uh, with the BMJ Evidence Centre and I'll be chairing today's session. We've got two quite different presentations today. The first one on effective disinvestment using evidence will be given by Dr. Diefred Hughes, who is currently Deputy Director of the Centre for Economics and Policy in Health at Bangor University, as well as being a member of the National Institute of Health Research, HGA Pharmaceutical Panel. Our second presentation on change management will be given by Professor Tony Rudd, who is consultant at St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, he's the Stroke Clinical Director for London and has chaired the NICE Stroke Quality Standards Development Group and the NICE Guidelines Development Group for Acute Stroke and Transient Ischemic Attack. Uh, we'll be having presentations followed by uh, a short period of questions and I'll now hand over to uh, Dr Hughes. Thank you very much and good morning. My presentation this morning is about disinvestment and um, we've heard much in the news about new drugs which are extremely expensive but the incremental increase in health benefits might not be might, might not be that great to justify the cost and so what normally happens is that there needs to be some way of finding resources to pay for these new and costly interventions and one particular way that we're looking to, towards is in, in disinvesting in current practice and this is more so important in the current, current economic climate where the NHS will need to achieve unprecedented efficiency gains to meet the current financial challenge and future costs. These quotes are taken from the Department of Health documents on equity and excellence that the NHS will need to release up to about £20 billion of efficiency savings by 2014 with this funds being reinvested to support improvements in quality and outcomes. We heard recently from the, um, the economic review in that the funds for the NHS is effectively ring-fenced, but in, in real terms it means only a 0.4% increase per year over the next four years. And so there is a real need to try and operate in a more efficient manner, and disinvestment is, is central to that. The NHS Confederation recently uh, published a report that on commissioning in a cold climate and where they state that PCTs need to identify opportunities to decommission infrastructure which include both staff and capital costs and so on as part of an agreed strategy to cease or shift service provision so it's becoming more explicit that there needs to be some element of, of cuts efficiency savings however you might want to call it in order to fund um, new technologies typically which are increasingly more expensive National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which um, announced yesterday, or the, the, the Department of Health rather, announced that there will be a, a shift in their focus in the coming years. Um, they have looked into disinvestment and they have a role, an important role to play here in terms of offering products and services to help organisations meet the twin challenges of uh, providing high quality care to patients and the public while also saving money and resources. And they claim that the guidances and the technology appraisals that they've issued, if implemented as predicted by the, by the, the appraisal teams, would save around about £600 million annually through reduced use of ineffective interventions and promoting the use of more efficient interventions. Going back to the Department of Health, documents on equity and excellence, the QUIP, Quality Innovation Productivity and Prevention Initiative, is also in the process of identifying how efficiencies can be driven and services redesigned to achieve improved quality and efficiency. So it's a recurring theme um, from different components and different aspects of the NHS where there's a real need for efficiency, um, implementing efficiency, efficient strategies in the delivery of health care. So that leads me to, to the formal definition of disinvestment and how it links in with the concept of opportunity cost. 
This investment essentially is the consumption realization or reduction of investment or a diminution of capital goods. So in other words, it's a withdrawal of service to release funds that can be used in a more efficient manner. And linked closely to that is the concept which health economists are very fond of, and that is of opportunity cost, which essentially put is that the loss of, uh, sorry, opportunity cost is the loss of other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. So investing £100,000 in one particular area means that there's £100,000 no longer available to be used in another. And these two are clearly interlinked. If you invest in a new treatment, which is um, arguably more effective, but considerably more expensive, then within a system of fixed budget, you need to disinvest from another area in order to be able to fund the new therapy. So NICE have touched upon disinvestments. I mentioned earlier the um, report they had about the potential for saving £600 million pounds per year. Um, but one thing they don't do is to explicitly appraise health technologies which are deemed to be ineffective or inefficient. They focus more so on um, new therapies and new health technologies which um, are arguably a little bit more effective um, but are typically considerably more expensive. And the consequence of NICE decisions is that the NHS in England and Wales is legally obliged to fund treatments that are recommended by NICE's technology appraisal committees. But clearly NICE doesn't receive any extra money to support its recommendations. And so on a local PCT type level, there needs to be some mechanism to try and um, identify funds in order to, um, to, to, to pay for these new technologies that NICE recommend. And, that, and that's my second bullet point here, is that the funding of new expensive interventions relies on releasing funds by displacing other treatments. But the problem is that NICE doesn't specify how these savings are to be made. Okay, so it'll specify which areas to invest in new treatments, but it doesn't specify which areas to disinvest in order to fund them. And the potential consequence of that is that a lack of direction by NICE on candidates for disinvestment will lead to the same geographical variation that NICE was established to reduce. So if you have problems, if, sorry, if you have decisions in different regions of the country on which technologies and services and programs to disinvest, and those decisions are not consistent, then clearly there's going to be differences in care um, and the geographical variation is almost a negative postcode prescribing, um, which NICE was established to reduce back in 1999. There have been several reports, one by the National Audit Office, on, um, on prescribing in primary care. I'm going to focus the remainder of the talk on medicines and ways in which we could potentially reduce costs in medicines. The NHS in England spent about £12 billion on medicines in 2009 and clearly there is um, much scope to reduce the drugs bill um, and, and there are several ways which might help um, achieve that aim and one would be for, um, for better prescribing uh, if I can call it that and the National Audit Office report suggested that £200 million could be saved if all PCTs in England used the number of medicines in the same way or at the same standard as the 25% most efficient PCTs. So it's, that, that, that's a suggestive of variation in practice across PCTs, and if the least efficient PCTs were to perform somewhat better, um, then there's a potential there to, for a saving of 200 million pound annually. So how might we identify um, medical interventions which might be appropriate candidates for this investment? Well, there are many signals that might point towards something not being um, effective or not being sufficiently efficient to warrant um, health care expenditure. And it might be triggered by new evidence. Um, and the, the conference clearly is, is very much driven by evidence, so it fits in neatly with evidence of things not working as much as evidence of things working well. And so if there is a suggestion of um, a health technology or a medicine 
being ineffective, and clearly that's a, an obvious candidate for investment. Or, or equally, if there is a new medicine for the same indication, which is more effective, then the older medicine would be a, a suitable candidate potentially for this investment. Safety, we hear about new drugs which, and existing old drugs where there, um, where there are safety concerns that are only evident over time um, and clearly any new safety problem then it, it's a potential candidate for disinvestment. We saw coproximal no, not so long ago being withdrawn by the regulators, the MHRA, and there were several million pounds spent on coproximal, which was no really uh, not much more effective than existing analgesia, um, though it did have um, the potential safety hazards in terms of, um, of suicides and so on and so forth. If there is any new evidence on cost effectiveness, so for instance if a, a generic alternative became available, then it seems reasonable enough not to promote the use of the branded product. And so m many of these points are common sense, um, but the, the, the challenge is in implementing uh, a, dis a case for disinvestment once there is a suggestion that there might be a potential medicine or a candidate, um, sorry, a, a medicine that is candidate for disinvestment. Another form of signal might be variation in care, and there are several studies that assess variation in prescribing um, practice across England and the remainder of the UK, um, and clearly where there are discrepancies in use, then that might be a signal as to potential that in some localities they might be using something that's more effective than in others. So when there is various variation in practice, then that could be a signal for something which is less effective or at least less efficient. There's increasing use um, of, or rather increasing concern about drugs used outside their license indication. And the, the, there have been recent reports on the cost of specials, so drugs um, manufactured without a product license um, and their costs are quite astronomical. So omeprazole, for instance, formulated as a liquid, as opposed to the capsules, um, can cost up, up to about £800 compared with pennies um, for, the, for the capsules. Other signals for candidates for disinvestment include um, some technological development. So perhaps there's a new therapy which has a, a change in formulation. So it might be something that's given once a day as opposed to twice a day, um, and with claims that it is more effective and promotes patient adherence and so on. Um, but in actual fact, it might cost several fold greater than the existing therapy, which is twice a day formulation. And so do you invest in the new, um, or do you disinvest in the old? And there's a balance to be made there. Um, is the new agent more, or the new formulation, is it more effective, is it more cost effective? or is the older preparation good enough? Okay, so there, there are clearly issues here in, in terms of interpreting the evidence and making a decision for the inclusion of a particular drug in the formulary. And the final point I've, I've listed here, this is taken from a, an excellent overview of the issue in the Medical Journal of Australia, um, and clearly consultation with special interest groups and, and guideline development groups of, of NICE, for instance, involve a range of experts who make decisions as to the most effective, uh, most cost effective, and likewise services and interventions that shouldn't be used because they're ineffective or not cost effective. So we recently published an article in the BMJ about um, how new drugs might displace old and whether that's appropriate or not. And we went through some case studies where the potential for um, investing in new could be uh, worthwhile or appropriate use of healthcare funds, but also several examples whereby the existing therapy was actually preferred to the new on the basis that the, um, the, the, the increasing cost just simply isn't justified by any evidence of benefit. Recently also produced a review of comparing branded and generic medicines um, and not so long ago, only last year, the, the PPRS, the Pharmaceutical Price 
um, regulation scheme proposed um, that the Department of Health will introduce generic substitution in primary care. So in other words, doctors writing prescriptions for a branded product could be um, presented to the pharmacist, would, the pharmacist in turn would be able to dispense the generic equivalent. And that would have a predicted um, saving of several tens of million, uh, because although generic prescribing is, is very high, um, 80 odd percent, there is still room for further generic prescribing and re reduction in branded prescribing. And that was the Department of Health um, stance um, that they would introduce automatic substitution by pharmacists in primary care. So we looked at the evidence on equivalence between branded and generic medicines and there have been a couple of um, reviews published in, in, in reputable journals. This one from JAMA compares branded versus generic drugs for cardiovascular diseases and included the, um, a range of drug classes, beta blockers, diuretics, calcium channel blockers and so on and so forth. And identified studies for each of these ranging from single studies to 10 studies in the case of diuretics. Calculated the effect size from, this, uh, from each individual trial and pooled the results in a meta-analysis. And you see the, the overall estimate um, doesn't favor either, neither the branded nor the generic equivalent. So the clinical evidence, as you might expect, suggests equivalence in health outcomes when comparing generic versus branded medicines. Now, given that the cost of branded can be as much as three, four, five times the cost of generic, it would clearly make sense to, to prescribe the generic um, when one is, um, is available. A more contentious area might be to do with drugs for epilepsy. And there have been several articles suggesting that change from branded to generic um, might uh, upset the, 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 the treatment of, of epilepsy and induce seizures. But there was a recent review published earlier this year, um, smaller studies in this case, um, but nevertheless none of the studies individually showed any favour um, for the generic versus the branded um, when it came to assessing uncontrolled seizures after a switch. Um, and the overall pooled estimate at the, the top of this figure um, shows an odds ratio of 1 and um, the 95% confidence intervals either side of 1. So again, even in an area where there has been debate on the appropriateness of genetic switching, the evidence suggests that there, is, there isn't much difference, if any, um, when using a far cheaper generic compared with uh, a more expensive branded product. Only a couple of weeks ago, the government um, responded to the original proposal in, uh, of last year, and they decided not to progress with plans for the generic substitution of medicines in primary care. So a bit of a U-turn there, but clearly we've had a new government in the meantime. Um, and the reasons that I gave were, were quite weak, but they said that national plans to enforce generic substitution in primary care are too prescriptive. So in other words, they wanted GPs to have um, their own, uh, to, to make up their own minds as to what they wanted to prescribe. And that's the way clearly the NHS in England is moving, um, as we've heard in announcements in recent times. So that's a, a missed opportunity in a way. There is a good case there for um, several tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds of savings through the use of generic versus um, branded, but clearly it wasn't in the government's interest. The second category I want to refer to are Me Too products. And typically, you would have a first-in-class product followed by another one which is um, about the same, but perhaps a slightly different, well, a, a slightly different molecular structure, followed by another one in, you know, in the year to come, and, and that will have a slightly modified structure. And we see for each class of therapy, there might be half a dozen or more different drugs. And typically, the Me Too products, as they're referred to, cost slightly more, much more in some instances, um, each time a product is made available. And so there have been schemes, such as prescribing incentive schemes, to, for, for payment to be made to um, GPs to switch to equally effective but cheaper 
medicines um, through a financial reward system. And the Department of Health not so long ago advised on the use of standard operating procedures um, and they gave case examples of incentives in the field of statins where clearly um, generic, generic simvastatin um, is far cheaper than branded atorvastatin. Um, and so the, the issue of switching from a more expensive me to to a generic, usually first in class, is something that was promoted by the Department of Health. Unsurprisingly, the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industry uh, mounted a legal challenge against this. Um, and quite recently, the European Court of Justice um, looked at the case and ruled in favour of national public health authorities who have the responsibility of controlling public expenditure. So, so there was nothing illegal about um, therapeutic switching and prescribing incentive schemes. So that's some good news. So I'll go through the evidence um, in relation to statins. Um, statins cost the NHS in England about £450 million last year. That's just in the community, so if you can round it up to at least half a billion pounds. So it's quite substantial. And a, a fair proportion of that, £75 million, pounds, is spent on branded products. And you might question the relevance of that and the appropriateness of that. Um, but again, there's heavy marketing. Um, there are some instances, perhaps, where patients might not, be, um, might not tolerate simvastatin, and so it might be appropriate to switch to another statin, um, and so on and so forth. So that might capture and reflect that. And again, to add to the, the, the issue here is that there is a, a real lack of randomized controlled trials of switching from one statin to the other. So it's difficult to tell really whether switching actually works and whether um, changes in cholesterol and cardiovascular events are equivalent, if not better, um, from switching from one statin to the other. And this table is taken from a, a review um, a few years ago from the BMJ, which compared the various statins. Um, and I've rejigged the table somewhat to, to group them um, according to the reduction in LDL cholesterol along the, the top row. So we can see that the most commonly used dose is the, the 40 milligrams of simvastatin, which comes in at £1.40 for 28 days. And that gives you about 37-38% reduction in LDL cholesterol. And when you compare that with atorvastatin, which is, which is used, I mean, it's not used um, widely, but it, it's most certainly used as 10 times more expensive for the same reduction in cholesterol. And rosuvastatin, a uh, newer statin, another me too, um, is even more expensive at 18 pounds. Now, clearly, the trial evidence supporting these will be different. Some will be based on the surrogate endpoints of LDL cholesterol. Others might have harder cardiovascular outcomes. But nevertheless, um, you know, the, the differences in costs um, are quite substantial between the, the older first in class, which now are available as generic, versus the newer ones, the me too's, which are clearly far more expensive. The, the next category of pharmaceuticals I'll be looking in, into are what's called the evergreened products. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this concept, but a variety of legal and business strategies by which pharmaceutical industries with, pa with patents over products that are about to expire maintain market share by either taking out new patents or by buying out or frustrating competitors. That's the definition of evergreening. So in other words, a company might have a patent on a medicine and with a year to go on that patent, they develop a, they, they modify it ever so slightly and then they get a new patent on that product for another five, six, seven years. So they can switch people in, in the meantime or, or try and persuade GPs perhaps to switch patients from their existing treatment, which is soon to come off patent, to their new product, which has clearly a price premium to it. And there was a report presented to the House of Lords not so long ago, whereby they looked at six commonly used medicines where evergreening strategies had been applied. And the suggestion was that it resulted in little or no therapeutic gain to patients, but cost the NHS between 160 and 370 million pounds. It's quite substantial 
costs. And I'll go through some of the examples, um, one of which is when you look at the, the, the enantiomer, enantiomeric form of drugs, and many drugs come left and right-handedness, um, and omeprazole is one such example. That omeprazole is a racemic mixture of R and S omeprazole. And two years before the expiry of the patent for omeprazole, um, the, the, the manufacturers, AstraZeneca, I think, um, were granted uh, market authorization for S omeprazole. So they isolated the S enantiomer. And last year, the NHS in England spent £42 million on S omeprazole in the, in the community. And globally, it's actually the third highest selling drug. It's quite unbelievable in actual fact when you look at the trial evidence. There have been no trials to demonstrate the therapeutic advantage of esomeprazole over other proton pump inhibitors when treatments are given at equivalent doses. So why use the newer agents when an existing therapy is equally as effective, particularly when you consider the cost? One month of omeprazole is £1.80, whereas one month of esomeprazole is almost exactly 10 times more expensive. So that, you could argue that's £42 million that was almost entirely wasted. Second example of evergreening is to change the formulation. And what, there's several examples here, but the one I've picked up on here is sumatriptan used for migraine. And the manufacturers introduced a new film-coated dispersible formulation two years before the patent expired on their, um, their initial immigrant ex, uh, the, uh, formulation. There's no pro proven additional clinical benefits, but it costs 14 times more than the generic sumatriptan. Okay. A third example is to reformulate so, so that it becomes modified release. So quetiapine, which is very widely used, um, its patent will expire quite soon. And the manufacturers introduced an extended release formulation of quetiapine just before the um, the patent had expired, but they had no evidence of improved adherence or of improved clinical performance. All the trials were non-inferiority. There were no demonstration of, um, of superiority, superiority. There was no demonstration of improved patient adherence. But the cost, clearly, well, we don't know because the generic quetiapine isn't yet out, but I'm sure it'll be much, much lower than the extended release. The fourth example is change in, a change now in route of, uh, route of administration, and an example we're all familiar with here is transdermal GTN, um, which are far more likely to induce nitrate tolerance, and they cost substantially more than sublingual nitrate preparations. Other examples include combination products. So when a patent is about to expire on a single product, the manufacturers produce a co-formulated product, including some other chemical within it. And this is an example of alendronate plus vitamin D, which costs far more than either generic alendronate um, plus calcium and vitamin D taken separately. And you might argue, well, it might improve patient adherence. Well, it might well do, but you still have to take calcium because that's not part of the formulation. So you still end up taking two tablets instead of three. An example where the company, um, this is loratadine, an uh, uh, antihistamine for, for hay fever and other, other allergic um, type conditions, um, they isolated the active metabolite of loratadine, which is des loratadine. And the patent on loratadine expired, and hey presto, the cost of des loratadine is five times greater than the generic loratadine. So there's no real evidence of, of anything better in terms of clinical performance, but clearly it's very cost ineffective use of resources. This is an example of whereby they produced a new drug, form, sorry, not formulation, a, a different salt or a change, a, a small subtle change to the molecule. So perindopril arginine, um, for instance, was introduced when the patent of the uh, perindopril uh, butamine was to expire, but it confers no additional benefit and is three times more expensive. It's just a different salt. So when it's ingested, the parent molecule and the salt, they, 
disassociate in any case, so it makes no odds. And the final category I have is to do with physicochemical characteristics of drugs. And siroxat, peroxetine, hydrochloride, hemihydrate. So now the drug is peroxetine, the salt is hydrochloride, and hemihydrate is the, the form of the crystals. So this is, in, in some ways, it, it's sort of semi-hydrated um, crystalline form. And that has absolutely no clinical advantage over the anhydrous form, um, which is the generic equivalent, but it is four times more costly. So I've gone through a, a range of examples there of a, a, a process called evergreening, which is a strategy that pharmaceutical manufacturers employ to try and artificially extend the patent period. Um, but in the meantime, as the originator products become available as generic forms, um, they clearly, the, the newer varieties are certainly are not cost effective um, in most instances. So I'll go back now to looking at some ways whereby locally we could potentially look at some systematic approach to disinvestment. And the key issue here is to try and link investment in something which is new and arguably something which is better with disinvestment in something which is ineffective or at least inefficient. And one such technique that's been around for several years but not particularly widely implemented is program budgeting and marginal analysis, PBMA. And a PBMA exercise addresses priorities from the perspective of resources. And it asks a series of questions. First of all, the two first ones are in relation to the program budgeting. So the first question to ask is what resources are available in total? So you need to know the starting point of how much you have to spend on new therapies or um, services or healthcare programs and to identify the ways that these resources are currently being spent. So that's the PB component of PBMA. The second component is a marginal analysis. And what we're trying to do here is to look at um, the, the newer agents, first of all. So to list effectively the main candidates for more resources and what would be their effectiveness and cost. So identifying which areas to expand but to go hand in hand with that, and this is what NICE isn't doing, NICE effectively draw the line there, but locally we could arguably, arguably look also to see which aspects to disinvest. And there are two forms of disinvestment. One is when you try to achieve technical efficiency. So in other words, you disinvest in the same area as where you're investing. So there might be some treatments for diabetes and you withdraw one service for patients with diabetes, but you introduce another. So you're not really affecting other groups other than patients with diabetes. And that's what the fourth bullet point refers to here. The alternative component of this investment, of marginal analysis, is to look at um, areas outside the immediate therapeutic area. So now we're more interested in allocative efficiency. So we might um, reduce services in diabetes in order to fund more services in dementia care. Okay. And when these are all looked together in a systematic way, it provides a more cohesive um, framework in order to um, link the investment with the, with the issue of disinvestment. And just to summarize this, I've, uh, I did lift this from a BMJ from not so long ago, um, and it talks about NHS treatments, and there's a finite amount of funding to go around. So anything that you do invest in, it goes hand in hand with having to disinvest in something else. Thank you. So now if we could open the floor for some questions. Thank you. Rich Sates from Boston. Thank you. It was a terrific, uh, terrific talk. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is if you've seen evidence about what happens with switching um, beyond just the cost of the drug. So a as a primary care physician, 
uh, I'll often get a notice from an insurer uh, that says we're switching your patients or your pa individual patient from uh, atorvastatin to simvastatin. And then the next thing I need to do, if I don't disagree, because these things are done uh, uh, with, with my uh, consent, but, uh, uh, but with, at their suggestion, uh, if the next thing that I need to do is bring the patient in for a visit, discuss it, check liver enzymes, then I wonder whether they're going to be adherent on the new medication, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of costs and, and potential effects that, that go beyond uh, the drug. One other just quick thing I wanted to mention is that uh, at least in Massachusetts uh, and I think in the rest of the U.S., uh, if I prescribe a branded drug, uh, the pharmacist automatically uh, uh, substitutes a generic unless I specifically write do not substitute. So that is something that's in place. But additional costs. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's two fair points there. The first one is there is a, a lack of evidence on switching. Um, many of the, well, the estimates I provided on the statins, for instance, were drawn from trials where they, they weren't switching. They were simply just looking for LDL cholesterol reduction um, going with one agent. Um, and so there is an issue about that, and monitoring of patients during that change process is clearly an important clinical aspect. In terms of your second point, I've no doubt that in other countries the issue of therapeutic, sorry, genetic substitution is used and is, is, is a practice that's widely used, um, but in the UK clearly it isn't and it was a reversal of the decision of the Department of Health here that um, didn't make that possible. Um, I think, I mean, I, I think I'm sort of glad that the Department of Health decided not to go with that because it is a very, very blunt tool. For example, currently we've been informed, um, I work in London as a GP, that um, at the moment the Bentolin MDIs are actually cheaper than the generic salbutamol. So we're all being encouraged to actually prescribe Bentolin rather than salbutamol, which goes against what we've been trying to do for the last 20 years. Um, but there are a number of things which would make it a lot easier for GPs. Um, I don't know what the gentleman there said he gets feedback from the insurers. Um, we could get feedback much, it would be very helpful if, in our prescribing if we had feedback on two levels. One is when we actually go to do the prescription on the computer, if the price information was accurate and up to date, and even better if the cheapest one came top of the list so we didn't have to scroll down. And secondly, if we could get at least practice level um, prescribing data back in a timely fashion, because if we don't know that we're out of line with everybody else, we're not going to be encouraged to move. Yeah, I think they're good points. I think that you know, there's a real issue of IT here, isn't there, really, that would facilitate many of the points that you've raised. Um, one interesting observation is that atorvastatin's patent, the European patent, will expire in about a year or two's time. So then when the generic atorvastatin comes out, will everybody be switched to that from the generic simvastatin, I wonder? So there are a whole load of issues here, and as you rightly point out with the Ventolin, it is actually cheaper than the generic, so there are lots of um, oddities that would need to be ironed out had something like this been implemented. Hi, um, Christine Bennett from Bupa Australia. Um, I had uh, two questions. One, one related to the 25% of PCTs that were most efficient. I was just wondering if you could explain what most efficient meant, because sometimes that translate into uses the least, which may or may not be the most yeah. efficient. And the second thing was um, the payment, the financial rewards for me two drugs. I don't really understand why that's more problematic or less problematic than the generics. In Australia, what we do is um, the doctor has a little box, which is a brand substitution not permitted. Unless they tick that box, then it is permitted. So there is a a, a clinical opportunity to say no, not permitted, um, but there's an automatic uh, generic substitution unless that box is ticked. So I mean, given that you've got financial rewards for Me Too drugs, I would have thought it would be acceptable. Yes, I mean, the, the simple things such as including a box on the prescription or introducing some IT infrastructure would certainly facilitate um, appropriate ge generic substitution. Um, and you know there has been going back to the 1980s, generic prescribing was at 35 percent. So this increased from 35 percent then to 80 plus percent today. 
and that has been through education really and a lot of um, intervention through lead prescribers and pharmaceutical advi you know, advisors and so on and so forth. So there has been a cultural shift and you have to also question whether there's a, any real benefit of going the extra one or two percentage points when you're already sort of maxed out at the 80 plus percent. So, um, so there's a lot of issues there um, and, and appropriate generic substitution could have been something that the, the government might have considered in a bit more detail. Um, about the 25% most efficient, um, I believe, I'm not overly familiar with the data that they presented, but I believe they did um, control for, for local needs and um, local population demographics in their calculations, but it was to do with prescribing rates controlled for these other variables. The temptation at the moment is that um, responsibility is being given to the, the physician alone in the UK and that's from NICE's recent uh, decision about uh, cancer drugs but also in some of these areas, say desloratadine, the patient is absolutely certain that their desloratadine is more effective than the loratadine we tried to give them earlier. Um, and it strikes me that because of a political responsibility and answerability to an electorate which is whimsical <coughs> and variable, um, there's reluctance to take responsibility at national level for some of these issues. And there's a feeling that uh, there's a game called pass the bomb going on and that's coming into GP commissioning where instead of wanting to take responsibility at a national apparently we have a national health service here at a national level uh, that the bomb is to be passed to the individual physician and they have to have the punch up with the patient over whether it's cancer drugs or desloratadine would you like to comment on that? Well, I mean, that, I think that's um, all to do with the reconfiguration of the health service that we've heard announcements of in the last few days and weeks um, and moving responsibilities back to the, the GPs. You know, it's where things were in the, um, in the 80s and 90s and, and has it gone a full circle? Have we, um, are we going backwards or is it something else progressive? I don't know, you know, that's a, that's a whole PhD thesis plus in its own right. Um, I know, precisely. I mean, what I've argued, specifically in relation to prescribing, there is in the BNF, the, for many products, there is a, uh, a small box with NHS written within it and a line struck right through that box, and that's for medicines which are blacklisted, not prescribable on the NHS. And that list hasn't been updated since 2004. And I really can't see the, 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 the reason for that, because desloratadine surely is a candidate to be placed for something in the blacklist as something that shouldn't be prescribed in the NHS and that would be at you know, the national level and reduce the pressure on GPs and, and people locally. Uh, my name's Annabelle, um, Boopy UK. I've got two questions about where the biggest opportunity is. Your talk focused on drugs. Is there also an opportunity around compliance? Even if we focus on getting the best cost or value drugs, what about compliance? And the second question is, how big are the opportunities around drugs compared to devices, surgery, increasing techniques such as robotic surgery, which we're beginning to see more of? Yeah, okay, well in terms of adherence or compliance, um, it happens to be a pet interest of mine. Um, there, there have been several studies that have repeatedly shown how poor adherence is in practice. And so for instance, for um, I'll give you two examples taken from GPRD, which is a database of general practice prescribing and other um, uh, variables and, and parameters across the UK, whereby the median persistence for patients being initiated with antihypertensives is three years. So half of patients completely give up their treatments after three years. Now that, for something which is chronic and supposedly lifelong, is quite uh, an eye-opener. The second example is a very similar type of study, and this is of um, tamoxifen for patients with breast cancer. You'd expect perhaps that persistence would be longer. Now, controlling for, um, for survival and so on and so forth, the median persistence was five years in that instance. And again, they, they concluded that 
um, it should have been far longer than, than the figures suggested. And these types of figures are repeated. There are several studies of patients not being adherent to um, cardiovascular medicines and subsequent hospitalizations because of heart failure, for instance. Um, and so there is much to be done in improving patient adherence, which is woefully low at the moment. And, and there's, there was a nice guidance on adherence to medicines published a year ago. Um, and you know, I don't know whether that's been assessed and how effective it will turn out to be. But there's far more scope to try and improve patients' um, adherence to medications. Well, if you can take your sec sorry. sorry, your second point, very briefly. You talk about other health technologies, and you're quite right. They are equally as expensive, and in more cases than not, there's even less evidence of the effectiveness of surgical interventions. For instance. Well, well, if we can just take one question from the middle there, from the lady in the middle, and then one final one from the front. Uh, Nikki Whitaker from France. Um, I've been out of the NHS for 15 years, so I, I may be out of date on this one. But an obvious candidate for, for disinvestment would be, due to lack of effectiveness, would be homeopathic medicines. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I assume the Royal uh, Homeopathic Hospital still exists, and I assume also that this must be some political uh, reason for it. I just wondered if you could enlighten me on, on why we're, the NHS is still spending money on it. Well, my personal belief, I think it should be illegal. Um, <laughs> I know that, again, I think the, the governments have made a U-turn on this, that there was a report suggesting that NHS should no longer be funding any homeopathic therapies, and they, a few weeks ago, announced that now they would continue funding them. It's only a few million pounds, but nevertheless, it all adds up, and, you know, the evidence certainly does not recommend or doesn't, does not suggest that homeopathic medicines is, are any better than placebos. What is the role of defensive medicine in British, uh, in driving up costs in Britain? And is that likely to change? Um, a good question. I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I, I really don't know the answer to that one, to be quite honest with you. Well, we, we can now thank uh, Dr. Hughes, please, and uh, hand over to Professor Roberts.